Hi and welcome back. This week we're going to be looking at uh, kind of a continuation of Manifest Destiny, but we're going to move into what is really more accurately called sectional conflict. We're going to be covering mostly the decade of the 1850s. And let's start out by discussing kind of some differences that we've seen developing between the North, the South, and the West. Uh, you guys may recall that the South and the West had traditionally voted together. Now when we say the West before 1850, we're not talking about California per se. We're talking about uh, areas that were generally east of the Mississippi River. However, as the West expands, the West is going to include California and a lot of those settlers that are gonna be coming in after the Mexican-American War when California is in that, that avenue of becoming a state from about 1848 to 1850. Um, so the New West is going to more so align itself with the North, not because it's manufacturing economically like the North is, but because it's, it's mainly uh, connected to the North uh, by railroad or by uh, river transport or whatnot. They become more interconnected economically, more so than they had been before when they traditionally voted with the South. Now that the South is becoming more... Um, slave oriented and kind of cutting itself off from the rest of the country economically not exactly but kind of isolated from them um, ideologically they're definitely trading with the north and trading with the west but mostly with the north but you'll see their voting patterns are going to begin to change around 1850. let's talk about manifest destiny how that leads us to where we're going to be uh, at this week first of all you should remember Manifest Destiny and our efforts to spread across the uh, continent from the east to the west and how we believe that God had ordained us to do so. And of course, one of the big prizes of that time is going to be California, which we will secure during the Mexican War. We have President Polk with his Oregon plan, with uh, his sights set on California, and eventually fighting the Mexican War. We're going to settle that, that question once and for all. But once we get through that, we're going to start seeing a new issue come up and that is the issue of slavery and expansion politics is slavery going to be allowed to expand into the political uh, realm of these new acquired territories and one man uh, David Wilmot from Pennsylvania is going to say no we shouldn't allow slavery to expand he is labeled an abolitionist by some of your older textbooks and some folks maybe from uh, a generation bygone but his politics on slavery are very different than what you might think of an abolitionist. An abolitionist in the traditional sense would be someone who opposed slavery, but David Wilmot opposes slavery not for the sake of the slave, but for the sake of the white man, and that's why his political party that he becomes heavily involved with, the Free Soilers, they are going to make it their, their, their battle cry that the new lands must be preserved, the western territories must be preserved for the free white working man, not for the slave. As a matter of fact, he even said, I'm not doing this because I care about slaves. I don't have any sympathy for slaves or slavery itself. I'm doing this for free white men. That was his slogan, that was his mantra, that was his battle cry. And so David Wilmot will, will uh, kind of bring the, the slavery issue to the forefront at the end of the Mexican-American War. California will come in as a free state, and that will bring us to a compromise that's going to have to be uh, debated in the Senate and in the House. The compromise of 1850, which is a series of laws that are going to be passed. Most notably, recall California's admission as a slave state and the fugitive slave law. Texas is involved with this also, but we're going to leave that out for the big picture. The fugitive slave law is huge. Southerners had demanded a fugitive slave law because if slaves were running away or they're being encouraged to run away by abolitionists, they want to be able to retain their property. And so the fugitive slave law comes in to help them in that regard. However, Southerners were very foolish to believe that this was going to be a one-all end-all for slavery because what this law is going to do is it's going to turn many Northerners against slavery and it's going to grow the ranks of abolitionists because if a slave escapes from Virginia and is up in New York, a federal judge could require someone, uh, uh, just a person on the street, a northern factory worker, to actually help in the recovery 
of a slave from Virginia. And if they don't help, they could actually be jailed for not helping. So this fugitive slave law is a terrible thing. It was a terrible idea from the get-go. Um, also at this time, we have the growth of anti-immigration policies. Uh, you've got, we've got Irish, we've got Germans moving in, we've got millions of immigrants coming into the country, hundreds of thousands at least, and um, we're going to, I exaggerated that just for y'all, um, we've got all these immigrants coming into the country, and what are they doing when they get here? They're looking for a job. They want a place to find work. They want to be able to make money for their family. And so these, these uh, uh, northerners, these free soilers are like, whoa, stop that. We can't have all these people coming in. They're taking our jobs. So we have the birth of the know-nothings, the anti-immigrant movement. We have the anti-Catholic movement because a lot of these immigrants coming in are Catholic. They're from Ireland. And so nativism comes along and nativism is going to be on the political ballot a lot and it will be mostly associated with this new party that's being formed, the Republican Party. Now, at the same time the Republican Party is being formed, Stephen Douglas, a Democrat, is trying to make a name for himself. He wants to become president so bad. He thinks that he's got a plan to fix all of these issues regarding slavery. If slaveholders want new slaves or want slave territories out west, and non-slaveholders or abolitionists don't want slavery out west, he says, let's do this the American way. Let's vote on it. Let's make this a sovereignty issue, a, uh, a popular sovereignty issue. You go in, you settle, and then you vote. And if you vote for your area to become free, then fine. If you vote for your area to become slave, then fine. And so he pushes forward the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which some people have blamed him for actually starting the war because in Kansas, the first of those uh, those two territories that are going to be settled, Kansas is going to become a hotbed of competition. Now, what Douglas thought was going to happen was Kansas being on the southern end, it would become a slave state, and Nebraska being on the northern end, it was going to become a free state. He thought we were going to have one free and one slave, and everybody's happy because we keep the balance between slave and free. That's not what's going to happen. We're going to have a lot of people moving in, some that had no intention of staying from Missouri, and we have some that had no intention of staying from up north, and they're going to be coming in, they're going to be vying for control of this territory, and we have what's going to become known as Bleeding Kansas, with different governments, one free government, one slave government, they're fighting with one another. We have um, Harriet Beecher Stowe's brother, uh, Henry Ward Beecher, sending in rifles to arm northerners to, to shoot and kill southerners who were coming in, who were being armed by other people, who were shooting to kill northerners who, who uh, opposed their idea. And so while Bleeding Kansas isn't really as bloody as it sounds like it is, it is a pretty violent hotbed. It's probably not a place you want to raise a family for those few years when all this violence is, is uh, breaking out across the board. Um, we're going to also have John Brown come out there. John Brown is going to lead his sons in a killing spree uh, murdering pro-slavery men in the middle of the night in response to the raid on Lawrence. We've got terrible things happening out there and our national leadership is just kind of not in tune to what's going on. Uh, the Dred Scott de decision takes place during this time as well where the slave uh, Dred Scott is going to sue for his freedom after he's taken to Illinois for a short time by his owner and of course the Supreme Court rules that just because you go into a territory that may be a free territory does not free you and so the Dred Scott decision is going to set back abolitionism uh, quite a bit and it's going to enrage a lot of folks as well. Um, we have the split of the Democratic Party over the slavery issue. Some Democrats are pro-slavery, some Democrats are anti-slavery, so now we've got a split in the Democratic Party. Some of these members are going to move into the Republican Party, which means your Democratic Party, which had been extremely powerful, is going to be very much weakened during this time. And then while all this is going on, we have John Brown comes back on the scene just a couple of years after the Kansas debacle, and he's going to raid Harper's Ferry. He's going to try to set up a free state for uh, freed slaves. He's going to ask all the slaves to come to him at Harper's Ferry, which is in current day West Virginia, but it then was located in, in Virginia. And he's going to tell slaves to come meet him, and he's going to arm them. You get a rifle, you get ammunition, and there will be a war on against slavery. Kill the slave owners, destroy slavery once and for all in this epic battle, which does not take place because slaves do not flock to uh, John Brown while he's at the arsenal at Harper's Ferry. 
John Brown is eventually arrested, he's tried for murder, and he's hanged. At the end of this, we have the election of 1860, we have a divided country, and Abraham Lincoln will be elected president, and we know what's going to happen from there. Southern states will begin seceding, um, and then we can debate what the war is going to be fought over, uh, the secession, and I guess it boils down to this. Southern slave states began seceding because they were trying to protect slavery. Was the war fought over slavery? Not so fast. But were the, were the states seceding over slavery? I would say there's a very um, good chance that we probably can't deny that because we can look at their, their uh, documents of secession and most of them are going to specifically uh, name slavery as the reason why they are seceding from the United States. We get to the next chapter, we're going to fight a war, and we'll decide the issue once and for all. We'll see you then.